Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, welcome to the, to the first SOAS director uh, lecture series. It's really something that we've uh, begun to think about at SOAS in part to enable the kind of conversations that need to happen in our world. The title of this lecture series is really going to be the dis on the discontents of our time and to think through solutions to the big discontents of our time. And it seems to me that there can't be a bigger discontent in this historical moment than the issue of the global vaccination campaign. Really this conversation evolved a number of impetus for this conversation. First, it emerged in a conversation with Saganet some uh, weeks ago when she and I were talking about what's playing out in South Africa in the vaccination campaign. And she brought to my attention some of the challenges that were playing out both in a center and in other parts of the continent around uh, simply the provision of not even vaccines, but normal medical equipment, things like needles and, and other kinds of clinical uh, equipment that would be needed in hospitals and laboratories, et cetera. And it seemed that global supply chains that have not only been disrupted by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the its impact on the production apparatus, but also because rich countries had begun to buy out supplies without thinking through the consequences for the world. And then in a sense, I came across uh, an op-ed by Martin in the Financial Times, where he made the case for why uh, it was important that we think about a global vaccination campaign. And he made the case, I thought, um, in a powerful way, because what imp he implied is this is not a charity. You're not doing a favor to Africa or Asia or Latin America or the Middle East. You're not doing a favor to the marginalized communities of our world by enabling the vaccination simply because London can never be safe. New York can never be safe. Beijing can never be safe so long as Buenos Aires, Johannesburg, Mumbai, Addis Ababa and the Philippines are safe. Because what this pandemic has shown and demonstrated is viruses do not respect national boundaries or continental boundaries. And frankly, it's very much like the other discontents of our time, climate change, renewable energy, inequality, global and social polar polarization. And if we're going to address the challenges of our time, we have to cohere as a human community. And we're never going to do so unless we figure out a way to treat each other as brothers and sisters, as a collective humanity, where each one of our futures is assured by assuring the future of others. And so it is in that conversation, in that kind of philosophical and conceptual logic that this lecture series was born. And in a sense, we thought that we'd kick off with this conversation on addressing vaccination in inequality in an interconnected world. So um, we've got some incredible speakers. We've got, if you like, somebody who's in the hot seat or as close to the hot seat as is possible, Peter Singer from the World Health Organization. He has dedicated the last decade to bringing innovation to tackling the health challenges of the world's poorest people. He's well known around the world for creative solutions to some of the most pressing global health challenges. He's the former chief executive of Grand Challenges Canada. He's also a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto director at the Sandra Rotman Center at University Health Network and Foreign Secretary of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. There's many other accolades of Peter, but I'm going to first, uh, give, I'm not going to go through all of them, Peter, just simply because I want to give more dedication to all of you to speak, more time to all of you to speak through the issues that you would like to. The second speaker is Dr. Saganet Kalem who's the Director General and CEO of the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology in Nairobi, Kenya, which is a United Nations University Center. She's the fourth chief executive and the first woman to lead uh, the Institute. 
And after more than 25 years in the US and Latin America applying cutting edge science that saw her garner numerous professional and state honors for an exceptional career scientist, Saginet returned to contribute to Africa's development in Nairobi itself. And then uh, the third speaker is of course, Martin Wolf, who's associate editor and chief economics commentator at the Financial Times in London. Um, he was awarded the commander of the British Empire, uh, quite a mouthful, Martin, in 2000 for services to financial journalism. And he was a member of the UK government's independent commission on banking between June 2010 and September 2011. Perhaps I would say one of the most thoughtful financial journalists uh, across the world. And so I don't think we can have a, a better panel uh, to speak uh, on the issues at hand. And so colleagues, friends, uh, I have, I want to welcome you again to this event. Uh, many of you have said questions. I will pose these questions to our speakers after they've spoken. And obviously, if you have further questions, please do write them on the Padlet and we will pick them up and I will direct them uh, to our colleagues in that regard. So we're gonna roll with you, Peter, and then immediately following that, Segenet and then Martin, and then I'll come to moderate the kind of conversation uh, at that. So I'll stop there and allow Peter to come in. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Adam. And it's wonderful to be here with uh, Segenet, with uh, Martin. Um, and uh, it is a privilege for me to serve as Dr. Tedros' special advisor. And I, I offer greetings from the World Health Organization. In these brief remarks, I'm gonna focus on our topic today, which is vaccine equity. I'm gonna talk about what it is, why it's important, and how we might address it. Um, in terms of uh, what it is, uh, first I'd like to say that equity is not new in the global health horizon. It's not new in, in, in public discourse. And, and uh, one way to situate vaccine equity is you could think about 2020 as the year that where COVID, which is really, I think the worst global health crisis in 50 years, maybe the worst global crisis in, in 70 years, sorry, in hundred years, worst, worst global health crisis in a hundred years since the pandemic flu, uh, worst global crisis in, in 70 years or so. Um, you could think about uh, 2020 as the year where COVID shone a very harsh light on the pre-existing social and economic inequities where racialized communities, where where uh, others really bore the burden of, uh, of, of COVID. You can think about 2021 as the year of vaccine equity, and you can think of 2022, hopefully, as the year of a primary healthcare oriented equitable recovery. So just to situate equity as a more general issue in COVID. Now, zeroing in on vaccine equity, um, we know that about 150 million people in the world uh, have been uh, fully vaccinated. And there have been about 350 million vaccine doses given. But these, uh, this vaccination has been highly inequitable. Uh, if you look at pandemic.com, their vaccine equity tracker, um, in high income countries, about the, the, the rate of vaccine doses per hundred of population is about 15%, just over 15%. Now you'd have to get to 200 to be fully vaccinated since most need uh, uh, two doses. But by comparison, in non-high income countries, it's just under 2% of vaccine doses per 100 population. So that's uh, essentially a seven-fold difference between high income and non-high income countries. And that's certainly uh, a nice uh, snapshot, not so nice, but certainly snapshot of vaccine inequity. Now, when we ask ourselves how much vaccination is needed, um, I think we have to consider three scenarios. One is the scenario where you just want to vaccinate everybody. And there, there's about 7.2 billion people, just over 7 billion people. So maybe just under 14 billion doses of vaccine. Not everyone may want one. Not every vaccine is two dose, but those are some rough numbers. But that's not the only scenario to consider because the cloud on the horizon is the variance. So if we get into a situation of boosters, then that starts to look like antiviral software in the real world. And depending on how frequent the boosters are, uh, that can be uh, a much greater number of doses. 
And then finally, um, pandemics are a perpetual threat and there has been historically a cycle of uh, panic and neglect. So there's also an issue of even if COVID is finished, even if the variants are addressed, protecting ourselves against future pandemics. So in summary, in terms of what is vaccine equity, uh, it's situated within a spectrum of equity or inequity related to COVID and of course, more generally. Uh, and uh, I've given you some uh, statistics on the sevenfold difference and I've sketched some scenarios because depending on which of those scenarios we're actually in, and to be honest, it's not 100% clear which of those scenarios we're in, um, certainly the first and the third, that'll determine the number of doses and the context. So that's a little bit about what. Let's now talk about the why. And in particular, I think it's obvious for anybody why you would wanna end the pandemic in your own country, but why would you wanna end it in every country? In other words, what are the reasons underlying global vaccine equity? What are the justifications? Why should we all want it? I think there's three sets of reasons, uh, ethics reasons, economics reasons, and national security reasons. In terms of the ethics reasons, uh, equity itself, of course, is a uh, ethical value. Um, there's theories of justice that undergird that uh, and, and so on. Um, but writing about 15 years ago, Sali Benatar, Abdullah Dar and I, when we were surveying uh, uh, global health ethics values, uh, we identified a cascade of values where equity was at the top, solidarity inter and interdependence undergirded equity and empathy undergirded solidarity and interdependence. If you don't have a feeling of empathy for, as you put, you said, uh, Adam, in the introduction, your brothers and sisters, then you don't care about solidarity. And if you don't care about solidarity, then you don't care about equity. So I think it's probably more, um, uh, I think it's important to understand a cascade of values and not equity alone, because it's too easy to ignore uh, issues of global equity. Anyway, so one set of reasons is ethical reasons. Another set of reasons is the economic uh, reasons. And I won't belabor these uh, sharing a panel with, uh, with Martin, um, uh, but just to say, you know, the ICC, for example, has put a price tag, I think of nine plus trillion dollars on, on, on the pandemic. And, and just to say that these numbers are very, very high relative to the actual cost of funding some of the mechanisms to help resolve the pandemic, like the COVAX facility, which I'll come to. I don't think there's any higher value for money in the world than funding the rollout of vaccines. The third set of reasons, which I think we've heard less about, uh, are national security reasons. And I do think that the pandemic has some, uh, obviously has some uh, real, uh, resonance with national security threats. And we're not always used to thinking about national security in this way. Certainly in the US, it, it was part of the first national security directive of the incoming administration. But some of the features that I think also make this a national security issue are its trans transnational features, and also the fact that it deals with critical infrastructure. If you think about hospitals, medical facilities, and especially health personnel as critical infrastructure. And by the way, health workers are about 3% of the general population and about 14% of COVID cases. So they've really borne a disproportionate uh, burden. So the second uh, part of this uh, talk has been to try to sketch some of the underlying reasons, the why of global vaccine equity. Having talked about the what and the various scenarios we might be looking at, having talked about the why, I'd now like to turn to the how how can we achieve uh, global vaccine equity? And just to say that I think the starting point for that question is a focus on what it is exactly that we're sharing. And here you can think about three Ds. We could be sharing dollars, we could be sharing doses, vaccine doses, or we could be sharing domestic production, manufacturing, and know-how. Let's focus first on dollars and doses. This was really the initial uh, focus of the, of the COVAX facility, which is a partnership among WHO and uh, the Global Alliance for Vaccines, Gavi and uh, CEPI, uh, the Co Coalition for uh, Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, and UNICEF. 
And this is a terrific thing. In the first two weeks of March, COVAX, and you've probably seen on social media, the airplanes arriving in, in different countries, will have distributed around 35 million doses of vaccines in 51 countries. So this is really terrific. And by the way, the limiting factor is probably not dollars at this point, it's probably the vaccine doses. But in any event, dollars and doses, this massive operation, maybe the biggest logistical operation since the, since the Marshall Plan um, is one way to deal with the immediate needs of vaccine equity and especially um, uh, moving towards uh, the first of the scenarios I mentioned ending the pandemic. But if we're in the late stages of that, or if we're in the booster scenario, the antiviral software coming into real life, not quite in your Nespresso machine every morning, but uh, maybe uh, that's an analogy. Um, or if we're interested in avoiding the future cycle of panic and neglect, and we're really going to be serious about future pandemic preparedness, then I think we need more. And that's where domestic manufacturing comes in. Dr. Tedros, uh, my colleague and friend, was very clear last Friday in the press conference uh, that he gives. He's been meeting the world media uh, twice a week, uh, more than 150 times during the pandemic with his colleagues. He sketched four approaches that the World Health Organization is taking to increasing domestic production. First, he talked about uh, partnerships on fill and finish for vaccines. And an example of that would be the Merck-Pfizer uh, partnership announced a couple of weeks ago. Then he talked about bilateral technology transfer, second approach. And an example of that would be the Oxford AstraZeneca Serum Institute uh, technology transfer. Then he talked about a coordinated, or perhaps you think about it as a multilateral approach to technology transfer. And the defining example here is what WHO did with influenza vaccine technology transfer between 2005 and 2015, where the technology for making influenza vaccine was uh, transferred, I think, to 14 countries. Um, and that's actually a very important and interesting model to apply uh, to COVID vaccine. And then finally, um, he talked about the TRIPS waiver that's very much uh, before the uh, uh, World Trade Organization this week, and he's come out and WHO has come out in favor of the India-South Africa um, proposal to waive intellectual property rights. As Dr. Tedros says, if not now, then when? So if we're in a temporary basis to facilitate this increase in domestic production. So um, where you go on that dollars, doses, domestic manufacturing or production continuum depends on which scenario you are targeting. But one thing that I think is uh, clear from this current pandemic is that um, self-reliance, maybe even sovereignty, maybe of nations, but definitely of regions is something that's at stake when you're thinking about global supply chains. And that's become very, very clear in this uh, pandemic. So, you know, economists might tell you that it would actually cost more to do domestic production of vaccine. But that's where some of the national security arguments and some of the issues of regional security, I think, come into play. So having talked about what uh, we might consider to be vaccine equity, why it's important, the ethical, economic, and national security reasons, how we might address it, dollars, doses, and domestic production, I'd now like to close with just a few simple things that you can do, that everybody listening uh, can do. And um, uh, the first thing I'd like to mention is WHO's movement for vaccine equity. And Dr. Tedros and WHO have called for um, the vaccination of health workers and older people and others at high risk to begin in the first 100 days of this year. The culmination of that is April 7th, which is World Health Day, which will be focused on the theme of equity. This definitely puts a human face on the campaign. And it also uh, raises the question uh, about, you know, why are we clapping for health workers if we're not willing to protect them? And why is it that Harriet, the midwife in Uganda, who puts her own life at risk uh, to care for her patients and her community, is less deserving of a vaccine than 
uh, someone in the UK or someone in Canada. These are fundamental issues in the solidarity empathy cascade that I was talking about. And obviously I'm using the counterfactual to suggest that uh, Harriet is no less deserving. She's equally deserving because as you said, uh, Adam, in your introduction, because of our collective humanity and the equal dignity and worth of uh, humans around the world. Anyway, so there's a declaration you can sign. Just look up Vaccine Equity Declaration, WHO, and please sign on. Please join the movement because this will actually help in terms of the dollars and the doses and the domestic manufacturing, uh, such a social movement. But the last point I want to make is um, the other thing that each person listening here can do, and I'm particularly speaking to the young people here, I know there are many students, is to lead. I was remarking with, uh, with the panelists before the call about how the soft infrastructure around equity, around solidarity, around leadership have really proven to be key factors uh, in, in the pandemic to go alongside the science and the unprecedented success of the vaccine effort scientifically and, uh, and, uh, and the public health uh, measures. Um, the shocking statistic is there's probably a 50 fold difference in cumulative mortality rate. If you go, for example, to the Oxford R World in data, uh, a data set, 50 fold difference in cumulative mortality rate across G20 countries. Now, some of that is luck when, when you got the pandemic, et cetera. But surely some of it has to do with, uh, has to do with leadership. So um, leadership doesn't just apply to national leaders. It applies to each and every student, young person, every person on this webinar. And in closing, what I just wanna say is it's actually leadership that's the ultimate vaccine. Uh, to address not only COVID, but the conjoint global challenges of racism, climate, and economic inequality, it's leadership, and that equity is in your hands. Really look forward to the discussion period. Adam, thank you very much, and back to you. And of course, to the comments of the other panelists. Uh, thank you. I think that gives us a, a lovely uh, overview of, of, of the global situation. Uh, there are some interesting questions that come to it. We'll come back to it in a, in a short while. But let's quickly go to Segedet. Segedet, uh, please Thank come you. in. Thank you, Peter. That was fantastic. And so I, you took a lot of my pointers, but uh, perfect. I don't have to repeat them. So uh, for, I see 265 participants. I think I'm sure there are a lot of young women there also. Happy Women's Day. Uh, yesterday was a Women's Day, and I think, uh, let me start from where Peter talked about leadership. And when we talk about uh, women also, at the start of the pandemic, the nations that are led by women actually did uh, a much better job in taking their countries out of this uh, pandemic uh, and uh, reducing destruction of their economies better than the guys, so uh, I salute them. But let me talk a little bit also from the African angle. Um, so uh, as at the start of the pandemic, uh, there were a lot of predictions uh, uh, saying that Africa is going to uh, collapse uh, from this pandemic. Uh, some predicted 10 million people are going to die the cities of uh, uh, major cities uh, and the streets of cities of Africa, countries are going to be littered with uh, bodies. Of course, all that, uh, those predictions uh, um, were not based on scientific data. They were not based on uh, anything, but I think uh, based on uh, my suspicion is on uh, deeply embedded uh, bigotry. Uh, um, undermining the capability of Africa. Uh, so, but I think Africa has done extremely well. It drew uh, countries first, they acted very quickly, uh, but it drew also from its example. It is a lesson from handling uh, 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 epidemics like Ebola, like HIV, like tuberculosis and a myriad of diseases. So uh, a number of countries actually have converted their infrastructures that were 
uh, for Ebola testing for uh, um, HIV for tuberculosis, I just did to their platform to uh, uh, pulled testing of uh, uh, coronavirus, uh, and so and they have done well. And when there was acute shortage of uh, uh, masks and PPEs, and the developed nations were fighting over this uh, shortage. Uh, uh, African countries sh uh, had shown the flexibility in uh, converting their textile, some of their textile industries, uh, factories into uh, PPE and, uh, and uh, production and, uh, and mask production and so on. And countries like South Africa converted, for example, their uh, uh, factories that produce uh, household appliances into a um, manufacturing of ventilators and so on. So Africa has done extremely well uh, drawing from its lessons uh, and so on. Um, so I think the uh, scramble uh, for, for uh, vaccine, this is not surprising to me, especially uh, uh, as I watched how uh, a number of rich countries have fought among themselves for supplies, for masks, for uh, uh, other uh, uh, PPs, uh, so uh, it was uh, expected to uh, to uh, uh, this uh, when a vaccine comes, this to happen. Uh, of course, uh, global vaccine, global uh, healthcare access uh, has been profoundly uh, skewed, profoundly unfair. Uh, so uh, this is not uh, unusual. So uh, to me also, I. I somehow understand, uh, it's understandable that uh, the priorities of countries would be to protect their citizens first. So I think I, I really understood that, that, I understand that part. But what is really deplorable is uh, countries uh, uh, pre-ordering uh, vaccines uh, five, six times their needs. And so the question is why? So why do you need that, that many uh, things? So it is, of course, it, this may be good politics, it may be good nationalism, but it's not good science. Uh, so I think the, the, the knowledge we have at the moment is to vaccinate uh, as many uh, people, uh, as uh, the vulnerable people in many countries, rather than vaccinating everybody in few countries. And uh, so I think this is where, um, the problem comes. And so uh, this leaves uh, uh, a number of billions of people in the global uh, south unprotected. Uh, so this is, a, this is a problem. And um, the, uh, to me also, this uh, equitable vaccine distribution is not a question of uh, fairness or it is not a question of humanitarian uh, action, it is really good science uh, because uh, if we quickly uh, uh, vaccinate as many people globally as possible, then we can put a break on this virus. So the, the way RNA viruses uh, evolve is basically a, a numbers game. So the more uh, virus, the RNA viruses circulate, the more they replicate, the more mutation. So my concern is that uh, if this goes on, there will be uh, mutations coming, there will be uh, then selection pressure, there will be more potent uh, and uh, more deadly uh, uh, variants that are capable of uh, ev evading or nullifying the existing virus uh, uh, vaccine can come. Then what? Uh, so we have to go back then it means to the drawing back. Uh, drawing a board again. So the best way to reduce this uh, uh, pandemic, to reduce uh, the variants, uh, is to to quickly manage and vaccinate as many people as possible uh, globally. So I have uh, a few, I think, uh, uh, points concerns I want to share. And so one is uh, variants that evolve rapidly, uh, and then. People cannot lock themselves indefinitely. People move around. So as people move around, new variants that evolve in uh, 
in Nairobi or in uh, Guinea or in wherever uh, or in Mumbai would move. Uh, so and uh, so these variants that are capable of e evading. The other, I think, uh, evading uh, uh, existing vaccines. But the other really big puzzle in this whole uh, COVID uh, pandemic is uh, that we don't know yet how long these vaccines last. Are they protective for six months? Are they protective for a year? Uh, we don't know that. So uh, as that knowledge comes then, uh, are the uh, rich countries going to continue to, uh, to keep these vaccines, uh, to, to vaccinate their uh, citizens every six months or every uh, uh, year or whenever it is needed? So this is, I think, a big puzzle that we don't know. There is also uh, currently there are there is uh, there are some trials in some places that are testing uh, whether three doses of uh, a vaccine would be more effective than two doses. So if there is so if the results come that these are better, three doses are better. So. Uh, there's no question that I think uh, uh, rich countries are going to to go to uh, to the route of uh, of uh, vaccinating their citizens a certain time, and so that means uh, again less uh, less uh, vaccine supply to the rest of the world. There is also uh, other types of uh, experiments that are going on, testing that are going on, and that is uh, a mixing of vaccines. Uh, so what happens if we mix? Uh, the mRNA-based uh, uh, vaccines with some other vaccines and vaccinate, so are, would they give more protection against uh, variants and so on? So if this happens, then uh, what will be the impact uh, on the uh, vaccine supply for the rest of the world? And this is also a big um, unknown. Uh, Peter has, uh, I think, clarified a lot on uh, on developing countries, uh, uh, you know, uh, potentially producing uh, generic vaccines, but I think, uh, and that is going on uh, in some some cases. But there are some vaccine producers also that are not willing to share their know-how. So waiving the IP uh, uh, enforcement uh, of uh, these vaccines is not enough. Uh, so. The, the issue of, I think, IP is uh, the, the main issue is the uh, uh, knowledge sharing and the technology transfer. It's not the waiving of the uh, the legal uh, the legal uh, patent issue. So um, unless this uh, knowledge sharing uh, and technology transfer is, uh, happens, then uh, the uh, generic uh, vaccine production in developing countries where there is a, a, a quite a bit of capacity in uh, vaccine uh, manufacturing, it's not going to happen. Then the other, I think, really major issue is also a, a shortage of supplies. I think Adam has mentioned uh, this. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, 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 a shortage of supply of uh, gloves, supply of uh, uh, needle supply of uh, uh, syringe and so on. Uh, so this, I am concerned that this may have effect on uh, the uh, uh, less uh, um, affluent countries, uh, poor countries, uh, 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 having a heavy burden on other uh, diseases with other diseases and other uh, other. Uh, um, uh, impacts on their people. Uh, so this is uh, an issue. The other day I read that uh, even Japan is uh, facing tremendous shortage of uh, uh, syringes. Uh, then it, it is uh, slowing down their rollout of va va vaccine, vaccine rollout. So this uh, shortage is if vaccines are uh, supplies are available, then I think all these supplies have also to come together, the syringes and the needles and so on. So it can't come one or the other. So I'm also, uh, with all this also, I have just to conclude also that uh, one thing which really surprises me is that all these countries put um, 
put priority list of uh, of uh, health care workers and uh, uh, elderly people and so on as a priority uh, or, or essential people to to be vaccinated so but how about farmers farmers who produce our food and people who are involved in the food supply chain so how comes they are not also in the priority list uh, so I think uh, that uh, there should be some thought in that. And finally, I just want also to emphasize about the power of science and the investment in research and uh, the global partnership, how all this came together to generate uh, vaccines in uh, record time, in a very, very short time period and developing all this testing uh, uh, protocols and kits and, and uh, all kinds of things. So uh, I urge a society to prioritize and to invest in uh, science and in research and to attract the best and the brightest young people to go into the profession of science because our lives literally depend on it. Thank you. Thank you, Sagadet. Uh, I think that that's, that's useful and it gives a completely uh, perspective that flows out of from an experiential basis in the developing world. So thank you very much. Martin, I'm just going to quickly move to you, give you the opportunity to come in for another 10, 12 minutes, and then we can take the conversation as we go forward. Okay. Um, I think it will only be interesting if I take a slightly different perspective. Um, so I will define, first of all, I look at this as an economist. Uh, and uh, and uh, and I th I will not take a philosophical uh, stroke idealistic view. I will take what I consider to be a relatively realistic view, and that will maybe get us into a to see where the disagreements and where the agreements will emerge uh, from that. Let me just start before I go into the details of the vaccinations. Obviously, the pandemic is, uh, as Peter's mentioned, an extraordinary event. Um, uh, it's been a devastating global event economically, um, um, one of the biggest economic shocks um, we know of, and not the biggest, but uh, enormous, with devastating fiscal um, costs. Um, and I think in many ways that's been a surprise to a lot of people. And I'll just stress one point, which is perhaps worth thinking about because it bears on how we're going to, we should think about the world in future. According to my rough estimates, on the basis of what we don't know, as it were about the Spanish flu, obviously the death rate then is very uncertain, but it seems plausible that in relative to human population, um, the death rate of, of COVID-19 will be two orders of magnitude smaller than the Spanish flu, which is a very large difference. But its economic effects pretty clearly are going to be bigger. We're not certain about that. So that tells us a lot about our world, in a way, rather good things about our world, which is we really care about human life. And that's something we all our societies share. And we are really prepared to, to bear very, very large economic costs to protect human life. And that's a transformation. I, I don't even begin to compare it with the Black Death or the other. So that's the first, I think, really big point. And it's a point of fact. We care about lives. And that has another consequence, which I think we just have to recognize. And this is a point that goes back to my book uh, on globalization a long time ago. We are... Humanity is in a very strange place, it seems to me, again, I've just seen how it is, which is that we recognize, and I'll come to this in a second, our global responsibilities, ethical and practical, but we are divided politically into 200 odd countries with regimes, be they democratic or less so, which feel accountable for their domestic population. And and in countries which have vastly different resources at their disposal for all sorts of reasons, historical, which we all know. And 
So when confronted with what their people regard as a first class crisis, and they do, as I've already indicated, economically and socially, these governments are under staggering pressure to respond to the demands of the domestic population. Um, and as has been rightly pointed out, we can see the squabbles, and I'm putting them gently, among developed countries uh, between Britain, for example, and the EU over this before we even get to the global level. So it's not only a matter of national security, as Peter said, this is high politics. This is really high politics. So that's the second big point I would make. And it's for this reason that in my own article, since it's obvious it was addressed to my readership, which is overwhelmingly, though not exclusively a developed country or readership, I wish to stress, and I think this point has been made, and I'll stress it again, the massive prudential case from the point of view of the developed countries to creating an effective global response to the pandemic, including the vaccine program. Uh, it is massively in their interest to do so. And I suppose I think that people respond, but politicians mostly respond more to that than they do even if, them, if we would like, like it to be otherwise to th their sense of global moral responsibility. And why should they care about this? Well, as you've already mentioned, a pandemic is a global event. A mutation in the virus will be a global event. Uh, uh, a, we have been made clear beyond all doubt by the speed with which this virus crossed the world and how globally exposed we are. Therefore, we must know that if the pandemic, if the disease continues unbated and unchecked in any part of the world, it will affect every part of the world. The costs of the pandemic were, and I can give you many different figures, simply staggering. Uh, just the GDP foregone over the last year and this year is probably going to be in the neighborhood of $11 trillion. There are many other dimensions of this. And there's some pretty good research which suggests that if there were a successful vaccine program, um, la allowing all the other countries of the world to open up and and trade and movement of people to return, that perhaps half of the gain from such a program would go back to the high income countries simply because of improved economic conditions. Um, as has already been stressed with a global vaccine program, we have a better chance of reducing the rate of mutation and uh, therefore bringing the, the virus fully under control globally. And furthermore, the opportunity created, and I think this links with what Peter said, the opportunity created by a global vaccination program uh, and the resources needed to make it work will allow us to build up health systems and health system capacity across the world. And as I stressed in my columns, the sort of figures we're getting from COVAX on how much this would cost to, cho to do are in the neighborhood of, well, they are less than two orders of magnitude smaller than the economic costs of the pandemic. So in essence, a global vaccine program is a fantastically good deal, uh, simply looked at from the prudential point of view of developed countries. Um, of, this is quite apart from the moral case, which is clearly, I, we would all accept, the lives of all people should be of some uh, significance to everybody. Um, and there are quite a few developing countries, not in fact in Africa or South Asia, which is why I personally never thought they were going to be terribly affected by this, but in South America, where age profiles of populations are such that the disease is devastating, and it has been devastating in important parts of South uh, America too. So there, there's a, clearly a very powerful moral craze. So that then gets us to the really big question, which is if you accept that it's fantastically desirable to have a successful global vaccine program, what are the obstacles? Uh, and I'd like to stress one point which has come out in this discussion, but I don't think has been given enough emphasis, which is uh, because it's true not just for vaccines, but also it appears for almost everything else associated with this pandemic, 
is we went into this unexpected disaster, or at least unpl inadequately planned for disaster, with grossly inadequate global capacity to produce almost everything. And of course, by definition, we couldn't produce any vaccines because we didn't have the science necessary to do so. So we have globally been racing to catch up on the straight supply side. To, in the case of vaccine, that's obviously to create the vaccines, produce the vaccines, distribute the vaccines and get them into people. Uh, that's an, a massive uh, a global, a truly massive global supply challenge. And ideally we want to do this very, very quickly. So what is the biggest single constraint here? Obviously the biggest single constraint is our ability to multiply very, very quickly uh, production capacity. And it seems to me that the most important single thing that has to happen is to increase the scale of the resources available um, to production wherever necessary. To the extent that intellectual property is an obstacle to that, and I must say, I'm not persuaded or dissuaded on that point. I talked to a lot of people about this, experts, and none of them seemed to feel it was an immediate obstacle. But to the extent it is, I'm perfectly happy to waive it. But the crucial point, obviously, is that new factories have to be made, um, uh, which allow the production of vaccines on a massively multiplied scale, because at the rate we're going at the moment, we will have only done a fraction of the pe all the people we will need to vaccinate this year, and it will go on for years, which is far too slow. And my core argument in my piece was that the rich countries, it will be cheap for the rich countries to provide the resources, mostly from taxpayers, um, to, to wherever they could be usefully used not probably in every country in the world, but quite a few countries, to expand production so that ideally, at least by the end of next year, we're making enough vaccine to cover the human population and quite possibly, as has already been suggested, um, well on the way to making the new variants of those vaccines that may be needed if new mutations require it. So I see this, once we accept this overwhelming prudential case for building up a global vaccine system, which by the way, can of course be used for other diseases in, uh, uh, in future. Uh, but to do this quickly as a, an obvious investment that the world needs to make in the interests of everybody, we don't, I have no objection to appealing to people's idealism, fine, but we can make an incredibly prudential reason for doing so because the vaccine, the, the, the virus is the absolutely classic example, the definitive example of a global public bad that we should all want to fight right now. And the resources we need to fight it now that we've invented vaccines are really quite trivial compared to the simply staggering cost of this pandemic. And that's all that I want to say. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so colleagues, we've got about uh, 40, 45 minutes and I do want to end this on time. There's some fascinating questions that have come up and I'm going to pose them uh, in five rounds. So I'm hoping that your answers can be pointed. Uh, and if somebody's answered it and you feel free, then we can go on to the other. I'd like to go through the five big issues. So the first that comes up uh, in all of you is that I want to end with what Martin suggested is a kind of realism. But in a sense, I suspect that all of us are not being entirely realistic. So Peter, you write and you speak about values and empathy, equity and solidarity and all of that is important. But in a sense, to move things quickly in the world, they don't work, work simply on social values. I, I give you conscientization is important. Uh, and so I raise that. Uh, second, it raises the issue of science and saying science is important and we need to understand it. And she's right. And Martin is trying to explain, look, it's in your economic logic. And he's right in that. But here's the problem. Politicians in the short term, they look after their short term interest rather than the long term. 
they can, in a rational conversation, understand and say all of this. And it seems to me we've got to shake them up and make them feel that there are consequences if they don't act in the ways that every one of you suggest. Now, when I recall in an earlier case, Peter used this early on, the treatment action campaign in South Africa when with the provision on antiretrovirals. What activists did is they simply took the, vaccine, the actual antiretrovirals and broke the law and entered the country and said, arrest us, see what you can do. Until that happened, the pharmaceutical companies realized that this could spin out of hand. And the government realized that this could spin out of hand and it prompted all of them to start thinking it. So the question I want to pose is realism requires not making the scientific case that's important or the economic case or the moral case, but is to start thinking about how you make the costs so dramatically high for the politicians that it, they, it's in their interest to act in this, in this regard. And I wanted to force all of you to think on that question. Uh, if I can force you. So let me start this time around with Saganet and then Martin and then Peter. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think, a lot of uh, points that uh, you have you have raised. Um, so uh, I think even politicians really can understand uh, long term, I think long term, if it is uh, if it is, uh, if they understand it, uh, even for a long-term uh, uh, process. But I think what I want to add to that also is that uh, there should be also governments, politicians, countries, leaders should really open the possibilities to give uh, scientists a full freedom to report and publish any any discovery. I think. Uh, I, I have this feeling that if, for example, when this uh, virus appeared in Wuhan uh, back, I think October or so, or so if they were free to report it uh, early on, uh, would this disaster have happened uh, in, in uh, globally? Uh, so there was, I think, uh, uh, a tardiness in reporting uh, the uh, the appearance of this the occurrence of this uh, virus uh, so that type of thing should should be uh, also uh, worked on for future pandemics uh, so this is not going to be the the last pandemic the last virus we would see there are over 30 or so described coronaviruses circulating have been circulating around uh, so this is not going to be the last. Uh, so I hope that we learn a lot uh, from the science, uh, from the political point of view, from the economical point of view, infrastructure from this so that we uh, prevent, not only maintain this, but also prevent uh, the future uh, occurrence. Thank you. Thank you. Martin? I'll just make one point. Uh, I think yours is a very good question, which is how do politicians think maybe the think is in scare quotes. Uh, but anyway, I will put forward a more, a more optimistic view. I think what struck me, and I think what Seganet says is very interesting, what struck me increasingly in thinking about social reactions, um, that one of the most powerful reasons for social and therefore political reactions, they are really quite close together, is experience. We, the striking feature of the East Asians is, you know, countries which oh. in many ways are similar to Western countries, Korea, Taiwan, Japan, obviously New Zealand, Australia, they act, react, responded differently because they'd had experience. Uh, and that experience had shaped the public and the government's responses. The simple truth is that, and I remember this very well because I was myself guilty of this in early February, is that the Western leaders and the Western publics simply didn't take this seriously. They couldn't imagine what this could do. Um, they didn't have the experience in a way that made them think 
this is really dangerous, which is why I actually think even if we'd known all about Wuhan, it would have made no difference to us. I'm not saying it wouldn't have made some difference somewhere, but it would have made no difference to us. Then they, the governments got buried and made endless bad decisions because they didn't have a clue. I won't go into all that. This is all about completely obvious if you look at the US, UK, Italy, Spain, and many other countries. Um, that's not true anymore. For a quite a long time, uh, we know what this could mean. And the society knows and they know. And that means they are inevitably going to be, I think, more sensitive to the risks. That creates a context, I'm not guaranteeing it, in which people are more likely to see, well, if we create a global infrastructure, a global system to monitor, manage and fight pandemics of this kind, we're going to be much better off. And by the way, it doesn't cost us anything. I mean, basically, let's the whole point of it, mate, COVAX, it's so such a tiny, I mean, it should be quadrupled, of course, but it's such trivial amounts of money. Only an idiot would, uh, you know, the, the UK has just increased its public sector debt as a result of this crisis by 25% of uh, GDP. Um, that's 500 billion pounds in one medium-sized developed country. Against this, this is trivial. So I do think it is possible with sensible leadership uh, that we can quite practically recognize what we have to do now and build up better global systems. And if not now, when? It is possible they're too stupid to do this, but I think the chances are much better for the reasons I've given than they were three years ago. Right. Peter? Well, first of all, I was very disappointed in Martin's speech because I was waiting for him to get to the part that I disagreed with. Oh, and really? there was absolutely nothing he said that I disagreed with. It was a brilliant uh, oration and I fully agree with absolutely everything you said. Um, I, I would like to clarify that these three arguments, the ethical arguments, the economic arguments, the national security arguments, let's look at them as a three-legged stool. I wasn't arguing idealistically, the moral arguments would carry the day. I was arguing together the three sets of arguments uh, going to different people um, who resonate with them differently uh, would carry the day. That's point one. Point two, who are those people? Uh, well, the thing about uh, COVID is it's actually not about development ministers alone, and it's not about health ministers alone. It's not even about finance and foreign ministers alone. This is a head of state problem. This is a problem, a challenge for heads of state. And let's just be uh, clear about that. And by the way, the reason those three arguments are all worth making is that this is an issue for development budgets, but not development budgets alone. It's an issue for domestic health budgets, but not health budgets alone. It's probably an issue for national security budgets but not national, and the size of those budgets increase as you go. And of course, it's, a, it's an issue for industrial policy and uh, the economic parts of the budgetary portfolio. So part of the reason I'm making those arguments is to appeal to beyond development aid, if you will. This is not a problem in development aid alone. It's a problem that affects heads of state. And then in, finally, last point I wanna say is I completely agree with, you know, uh, what, what motivates heads of state? There was a reason that I spoke to young people and I said, vaccine equity is in your hands. You are the leaders. Those are the domestic social constituencies that will make up their own minds about how they would like their leaders to act. And uh, only through those movements um, will leaders um, actually have the freedom to act. I believe most leaders want to do the right thing. But there's such strong domestic pressures to look only domestically. That's why an economic argument like what uh, Martin did alone, I don't think, uh, will, 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 will move a leader. Uh, now I'm talking about the political leaders. So to all the young people there, start tweeting, sign the declaration, join the movement. And that is what's going to send the signal to uh, heads of state and to other ministers around the world about what their own domestic constituencies want to do. And by the way, it's not just young people, religious communities. There's such a resonance normatively, for example, between tithing and zakat 
and vaccine sharing that hasn't fully been developed. And there's all kinds of uh, uh, motivation, uh, I think, for a wide range of domestic constituencies to send the message of what they want to their to their uh, to their leaders. So thank you, Martin. And you weren't really disappointing. You were brilliant. But uh, I did fully agree with everything that you said. And uh, I also fully agreed uh, with you about Seganet being a fantastic uh, role model for female leadership on the day after International Women's Day. And I just want to recognize that, my friend. I want to, uh, so colleagues, we've got about 30 minutes. I do want to go for another round of generic questions and then I'm going to target three questions to each of you. Uh, uh, the second question I want to pose is to attend, turn my attention to the, to the developing world. And Peter, much of what you say is important, but you didn't highlight the fundamental issue of delivery capacities in developing world government capacities. Um, there is an issue of corruption. I mean, in my own country, God forbid, we've had people stealing food parcels that were intended for victims of COVID-19. And um, so both those issues I wanted to pose to you and to second it, but I wanted to also ask uh, the second part of that question, should we mobilize private sector capacities that do exist in those countries? And the private sector has some logistical capacities to be mobilized for the public purpose of the delivery. So a, a two-part uh, question, one is the public sector inadequacies, both corruption, but delivery. And then how do we mobilize the private sector logistical capacities in the delivery mechanisms uh, around this. And this time around, I'm gonna start with Martin, go to Peter, and then come to Sedna. Martin. Well, I would actually say, I have the least to say on this because um, obviously I'm not in what are called developing countries. And uh, um, when I did work on development many decades ago, I never worked on health problems, but the, my general reaction to what you said is go something like this. A responsible government needs to find the most effective delivery mechanism possible. That's obvious. It needs to be part of a durable system, I think. Ideally, it needs to leave a legacy. And which will be the best mechanism or mechanisms will, I'm sure, it seems to me, vary by country. It will depend on the capacities of countries to do so. Um, you mentioned, I think, in the question to me, specifically India. Um, India has obviously a very large private sector um, uh, and a fairly undeveloped government health system. It's one of the weaknesses, surprising weaknesses of India, how little they spend on public health. Um, so it may well be the case, but I don't know enough, that using the private sector's capacities to deliver uh, vaccines might help. But I do think, the absolute final point, looking at the contrast with what I read is happening in the US with the UK, which is there are there tend to be quite significant internal equity problems, which are also politically very salient, domestic equity problems, if you don't have a national system in charge. And I think we have been helped in this case, at least by the existence of our national health service. Um, so I, w I'm a, I would need to know a lot about a country before I could say with confidence, yeah, okay, let the private sector do a significant part of it. Okay. Peter? On the issue of uh, public private, I agree with Martin. This is an all hands on deck moment. At the same time, uh, I agree with a point Fareed Zakaria has made, which is COVID has really shown the importance of government. Yeah. Uh, I mean, his point was actually Ronald Reagan was wrong when he said government is the problem. Um, so this is uh, very important. And there's a very interesting point to be had about the consequences going forward of debt and deficit spending as a result of the stimulus and the potential role of social finance and innovative finance in, in bridging that gap. But I won't go there in detail now. So that's on the public and private, uh, including impact investing and social finance. On the issue of uh, capacity to deliver, let me just focus on vaccines. Uh, COVAX is part of the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, which has four channels. 
diagnostics, treatments, vaccines, and health systems. And now is a good time to say that you need all those things and please everybody continue the public health measures of physical distancing and wearing masks and washing your hands and staying at home when you're sick and avoiding poorly ventilated indoor places. Uh, but that fourth pillar of health systems is where WHO and partners did extensive uh, work with countries backstopping ministries of health to look at the detailed issues of supply chain, of refrigeration chain, et cetera. So that type of uh, work surveying preparedness and supplementing preparedness is, uh, was very much the case and very much done uh, by the ACT-A, Access to COVID Tools Accelerator, WHO and its partners. Uh, most people don't realize that one of the key issues in WHO is 150 country offices and an incredible footprint of support to health ministries around the world. So that's a, a narrow take on the capacity issues. On the corruption issues, let me focus on the matter at hand, which is counterfeit vaccines. We have seen um, some media reports, and I think there some of the new digital tools, digital innovation, barcodes, et cetera, can be of great help. And you can believe that there's an, a very intensive effort on digital innovations around that and around uh, something we'll probably talk about uh, later, uh, certification of uh, uh, standards for certification of, uh, of vaccination and, and, uh, and, and so on. So some of these digital tools I think can really help us with at least the counterfeit vaccine uh, and maybe counterfeit vaccine passport uh, issues. And I wanted to limit my answer narrowly to be Chris Adam. Uh, on the matter at hand, vaccine equity on those latter two issues. Thank you. Okay, second it. Okay, I agree with uh, both Peter and Martin on what uh, has been said. Just I want to add that I think, um, yeah, that uh, a number of developing countries have a lot of experience in vaccine delivery, actually, uh, because we have been vaccinated against a myriad of uh, of different uh, diseases. And uh, also uh, a number of countries have also community health care system. Uh, I think they can uh, do uh, through that. Uh, there are also lessons to be learned. We are watching also how the rest of the world is doing. There are lessons I think we can learn from Israel, for example. Israel is, I think, that has mobilized a lot of uh, this. Uh, I think they have done well in terms of uh, uh, vaccine rollout, there are lessons to be learned from there. The one major concern I have, uh, which Peter touched, is uh, the refrigeration issue. Some vaccines needing uh, minus 20 to minus 70 uh, degrees centigrade, that could be a challenge. But there are vaccines that are coming in the pipeline that, uh, that don't require that high, high or very low uh, uh, temperature um, refrigeration. Uh, so that is the only concern I have. I think the, the rest rollout, I think there is a lot enough experience, I think, to roll out these things. Okay, so uh, what this does is I'm going to direct more pointed because we don't have much time. We have about 20 minutes. So I want to ask more pointed questions and then if colleagues want to come in. Uh, to you, Peter, uh, and forgive me, I'm going to now start asking difficult questions and I'm going to put you in a bit of a uh, the limelight on this one. What do you think should happen with the surplus and hoarding of vaccines that are sitting in the developed world in many parts? I mean, the question that came here is about the UK, but I mean, the same can be said of Canada uh, and many, many other uh, countries that have got three, four, five times. It's a point that Sagan had made. And I want to put you on what is your view or the World Health Organization's view on what Britain, Canada, and others who are sitting on vaccines, should they be distributing to who, through what system, through, the, through what mechanism, through COVAX or whatever? I just want to get your thoughts on that. And somebody in a related question asked a question about how do we fund? You've been struggling as who to, to get governments to fund it appropriately so you can deal with global health. Do you think this pandemic raises the issue of the financing of who and how that should be done. Thank you, uh, Adam. So uh, just very personally, my wife and I had COVID a year ago. Thankfully, we had a mild uh, case. Um, I signed up for the vaccine about two months ago, three months ago. 
I got an appointment faster than I thought I would, and I canceled it. And the reason I canceled it is I didn't think it was right. This was about a month ago uh, for me to be getting vaccinated at a time when health workers uh, were in the line of duty were risking their lives uh, and not being vaccinated, for example, in many African countries. And I knew full well that my vaccine would go to someone else in Switzerland and not someone. But I do think that these kind of reflective judgments are possible. That's the first point. Um, you know, having said that, I think what we would say is it would not be wonderful to see low risk young people in rich countries being vaccinated when Harriet, the midwife in Uganda, is putting her life at risk caring for uh, people in the community uh, and not getting vaccinated. So that's an actual issue. It's like the expenditure part of the budget, not the budget part of the budget. On the, on the multiple vaccines, um, you know, many countries, yes, they've ordered a lot of vaccines and they still have production and they still have scarcity. But I think the real metric on the actual side, and I'm just being realistic, is when you see low risk young people being vaccinated in some countries, when high risk health workers, older people, et cetera, are not being vaccinated in other countries, um, we have to ask ourselves about those ethical, those economic and those national security questions. And then we come right back into the recursive loop of how do we get people to really understand that, which takes us to your second question about funding. Um, very easy answer to that. Just put Martin on the phone. What an incredible case. Give the, give the G7 and the G20 Martin's phone number and let him go. I mean, to, to, if I'm joking, but what a, maybe I'm not joking because what a compelling argument. This is the best buy in the world. I mean, you said fantastic value for money. And there personally, I'll just say, I, I did WHO's first investment case and we did the return on investment based on some data from the National Academies before COVID of preparedness and it was 5.8x. Well, damn it, it's not 5.8x, it's like a thousand X or at least a hundred X. And so if there isn't a time that it's, I'm just fully agreeing with Martin, but putting it in the context of our own investment case, uh, if, if there, if the, it's just so clear that the return on investment of pandemic preparedness in COVID and in the future is enormous. And hopefully we'll learn that lesson and not fall into what my friend and colleague and uh, really, I think a wonderful global leader, Tedros calls the cycle of panic and neglect, because that's the risk. Can I add one tiny point? I'm sorry. Yes, I was going to pose a question to you and then you can answer the tiny point and the question. Okay. Okay, um, the question that I was going to come to you, Martin, is you spoke about the importance of distributing productive capacity around the world. And you spoke about that. And I just wanted to extrapolate on what, you know, how could we do this? Part of it is uh, you, you, you said if, if IP is a problem, then where it is, you can waive it. Part of it is about investment, but part of it, it seems to me, is about regulation and regulatory power. You know, if you want access to, in, in, I'm just using an example. If you want to sell, sell antiretrovirals in South Africa, you need to create vaccine productive capacity in South Africa in exchange for the contract. You write that into regulation in a way that allows that to happen. Uh, I wonder if you could speak a bit more about how we can create the impetus for productive distribution around the world, because it seems to me if we don't do that, we are always remaining victim to vaccine nationals. This is really, how many hours have we got to discuss this? <laughs> anyway, the point I was going to make, which will, I hope will stir things up a little, I was failed last time. Um, I think I'm going to make a defense of UK and US um, ordering policy. I suppose the argument they would make, I mean, I know it's the argument that they would make, was that they didn't know when they were making all these orders which would succeed. Uh, by providing hard cash orders for lots of producers, they basically assumed a large part of the risk in the system to solve governments. And of course, the same was true in Germany and there are lots of, and as a result, an incredible number or in partly as a result of new vaccines were created. 
a believable number and, and produced incredibly quickly. And I'm not sure in realistically, it could have been done through GoVax, but this is surely the quickest way. So the real issue is not, I think, how we got to five or six times, but the real issue is what we do with it now. Yes. And the issue, the answer to that pretty clearly is, Peter's given it, is that from now on, as the vaccine program is going to be finished in the UK effectively by the summer, all the excess vaccines have to go somewhere else. And we should be planning for that. And that's part of the supply buildup that I stressed. Now, your the, the big point question you asked is how do we build up supply capacity? Um, and here I think, I just may only, there's a, there's a, a medium term problem, which is the problem of COVID-19 over the next couple of years, building this up. My view would be, but this is subject based on the conversations I've had, is that the simplest and quickest way of doing that is likely to be to build on capacity that already exists, which includes, of course, capacity in some very important developing countries. Um, Brazil, for example, has significant capacity. India, of course, has the biggest producer of vaccines in the world. And if I'm going to be asked, how do we produce a hell of a lot more in the next year? I would have thought building capacity where there are lots of people who are familiar with it, where there's lots of know-how in constructing this, there are enormous number of scientists experienced in this is the way to go. Because as I said, the time is of the essence. There's a medium to long-term problem. And that's where I think the IP and other issues all rise. That's how I've seen them, which is, as you know, we need capacity to create, produce uh, vaccines across the world. Um, uh, and that involves, I think, not just the production capacity, though it's clearly part of generics. It's also, I think, to some extent, the capacity to create them, but that may be longer term. The uh, There are a number of countries which already have substantial capacity, which are large countries with very significant scientific capacities. I've mentioned them. I think, the, to me, and I leave this is perhaps a second, it, um, the most interesting case is, because there are so many countries involved, it's so important, is Africa. I can't imagine that you will want to have very substantial production capacity in every African country. Presumably, you will want to concentrate because you know, there are economies of scale here, pretty clearly. Um, and then there are some questions that Africans will have to answer them for themselves. And where they want this to go and how they coordinate it. Uh, in other regions, it's easier because there are obvious dominant producers already there. But I see that as a longer, not 10 year longer term, two or three year longer term question. The short term question is we just use everything we have now to maximize production. And if I were going to, to talk about that, I would go to SII and say, how do you triple your production? Tomorrow, that's going to be a bigger light. That's more likely, it seems to me, to succeed than building from scratch all over the world. Okay. That's useful. Second, um, I want to come back and you can come back to some other things. But what I want you to focus on is there's some debate that's emerging globally around vaccination passports uh, and vaccination passports and yeah. how some people can get vaccinated, get passports, and then they can travel while other people can't if they don't have vaccination passports. Is th does this worry you? Does this worry you given the, the kind of a class inequity, racial implications that can flow from this? And how do you see that? No, absolutely. It worries me. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, another uh, creation of inequity. Uh, I saw uh, two, three days ago now, the new uh, uh, CDC um, uh, guidance, guidelines uh, saying, okay, the people who have received now two doses of the vaccine, you can go together with the vaccinated people. You can go and have, uh, go to any restaurant indoors without any, uh, without any mask or anything, you can eat, you can socialize and so on. So it's uh, already creating that. So yeah, it worries me. But back also to uh, the vaccine supply, um, I think uh, 
pledging countries pledging to co COVAX money, billions of dollars or millions of dollars, millions, I think, not billion, uh, is not going to solve this problem uh, because there are, the supplies are not there. So COVAX gets uh, uh, money from rich countries, but then it goes around and competes with the donors, the donor countries uh, for the limited supply. So instead of giving until um, supplies are up and available, and instead of uh, pledging the dollar, maybe they should donate uh, the vaccines themselves to, to COVAX. And the other thing I think I would like to see is also, I think uh, uh, Martin indicated that uh, or the UK, uh, UK, US, uh, they did not know when they were uh, ordering, uh, they were taking risk and so on. But I would like to see them, they should disclose the agreements they signed with all these uh, vaccine manufacturers. Uh, so why are they keeping it confidential also? Um, so would like uh, to see that maybe. But I think at the end of the, the day, I absolutely agree with Martin that the way to really tackle this issue, the passport uh, issues, this uh, inequity and so on, is really to uh, revamp production, to make a vaccine available for everybody who needs it. Uh, in a, a short period of time as possible. Otherwise, I think this is going to continue. I don't believe also that, uh, that uh, uh, okay, for example, UK gets vaccinated all its population by the summer and then uh, it will release uh, the others. What if then uh, the vaccine is not valid after a year? So uh, they have then to uh, vaccinate uh, their citizens again. So, I don't believe that uh, they would release this, but I think uh, uh, let's just really find a way to increase uh, the production system so that everybody has uh, the, the vaccine that they need. All right, colleagues, we're coming to the end, but I wanted to give uh, all of you the opportunity to kind of come back in a genetic sense. You've heard the broader debates. There's many other more specific questions that I could pose. Uh, there are questions that are about um, how, for instance, more modern, more new technology vaccines like Pfizer's and Moderna's play out in the medical distribution systems of low-income countries. Uh, there are questions more specific to the US and the Can UK, Canada, US. Uh, there's a question about the West Bank and Gaza and the Israeli government's responsibilities in that regard. Um, there's many other kinds of questions. I wanted to give, give you an open uh, opportunity to come back. And I must say, perhaps it's my South Africanness that shows it and reveals itself here. But I must say that I still think that one of the biggest dilemmas is how do we create and make it in the interest, the short term interests of politicians to act along the lines that you want. And that given the domestic pressure that they subjected under, they tend to act while hearing your case and accepting it. They think that it's better to just respond in the short term to the domestic political constituents rather than the medium and more long-term solutions to resolving this. And it seems to me that that dilemma remains in this conversation. Uh, let me go and come back to Peter uh, and then Segnet and then Martin as your final remarks. Sure, uh, I just want to underscore something Segnet said uh, earlier. This pandemic has turned the north-south issues on their head. There are some so-called developing countries that have done extremely well because of their muscle memory that could teach so-called developed countries a thing or two about pandemic preparedness and response. And uh, by the way, our previous measures of capacity, laboratory capacity, et cetera, static measures like that are not very good predictors of cumulative mortality. What is are the dynamic measures. And the best predictor actually um, is uh, trust in government. So that is just uh, reinforcing something that uh, Seganet was after. But I wanna leave with three messages uh, and two of them are repeats. Leadership is the ultimate vaccine against pandemics and the conjoint global challenges 
of uh, climate, racism, economic inequality. Number two, to the young people and to everybody listening, equity is in your hands. Equity is in your hands. You can solve this problem in the ways we've discussed. And number three is one I haven't mentioned before, but I think a key lesson of the pandemic is character matters. You know, the one thing the pandemic has really revealed is how much character really matters. And I say all those things um, at the risk of Martin saying I'm a soft, mushy idealist, but I also fully endorse all the hard-headed reality of economics and the, and the political issues that were discussed before. But character matters. And maybe just in closing, one thing that everybody can do is to be kind. And I think that that's a, a message um, that I would have thought a year or two ago was um, a bit uh, mushy, but I. I think it's a very, very serious message actually after what we've all been through. Thank you very much, Adam and Saganet and Martin. It's really privileged to be with you all and with everybody watching. Thank you, Saganet. Thank you, thank you so much. I think um, I want to make uh, two points here. One is uh, that um, investment uh, is really important. Investment in early surveillance system early surveillance of uh, uh, pathogens, uh, whatever uh, comes in, uh, and countries to consider this as a national security issue. This is a major national security. So put a budget in their defense, the defense budget uh, along this. I think also for particularly for developing countries, investment in scientific capacity, both human capacity and infrastructure capacity. So this is really important. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, this is not going to be the last uh, uh, pandemic we will ever see. So this is really, really important for uh, uh, countries to, to really uh, uh, focus on this and uh, put a lot of effort in uh, investment in, in these areas. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. I think I'm going inevitably going to be reduced to repetition. Uh, when I complained once to my editor, my first editor 33 years ago that I, we were repeating something we said a week ago before, I wrote a week before he said, oh, well, that doesn't matter. Repetition is the essence of journalism. So I'm going to, I'm not going to feel too guilty. But I, I think there are four big things that I, I would stress. One, um, I think uh, Peter cited Fareed's point, and I've made this too. We have been given an incredibly powerful lesson that the quality of government matters. And one of the big differences, and you're absolutely right, it wasn't between developing and developed countries, so-called, that governments that, knew, that had an idea of what they were trying to do and were prepared to act decisively did well, and those that didn't, didn't. The second thing we learned which is a really profound point, again, not really a north-south distinction or whatever, is that trust matters. And trust is not just vertical, it's also horizontal. Societies in which people trust one another and trust their government and identify it with did better. Uh, um, so we've been given quite a big lesson about the fundamentals of a working society. The third point I'd like to stress what both Peter and Seconet have said, um, in my being hard-headed on economics. I didn't wish to imply this was only about economics. I think the pandemic has turned, and I could give a numerous things, to be quite simply, you know, I, I made this point in a quotation in a debate I had. Um, the United States spends about 6% of GDP, I don't know the exact figure, maybe five, on defense. Aircraft carriers, God knows, a whole slew of stuff, none of which was relevant, not a sou of it to the biggest security threat they faced since the Second World War, an event that has killed more, as many more people than in the Second World War, admittedly different people. Um, 
So we have been told now brutally what was prior to that largely theoretical, except again, as Segner mentioned in, in quite a few countries in the developing world, health is a national security par excellence. And once you think that way, you suddenly realize the budgets are completely different because everybody spends much more on security issues. Um, so if you don't spend on that, you're, you're completely brain dead. Uh, the United States, Larry Summers has estimated that the cost of the United States of the whole thing will be 75% of a year's GDP. I mean, next to that, any spending is nothing. And the final point, surely we have been taught that having working global institutions and working global cooperation isn't some sort of fancy, nice, idealistic, let's all be, be uh, happy together. It's an absolute na essential requirement of operating in a world in which most of the big threats we face are in fact global. Uh, and the health pandemic, and I've made this point before, has pointed out what the climate pandemic, climate, climate threat challenge is going to throw, that there are global institutions for very, very practical reasons. And those are the four points I would conclude with. So colleagues, I think that this is a, a useful part, a place to conclude. If I, if I can summarize what I'm hearing, uh, five big issues come out. One is leadership. Peter makes this point and all of you did. Two is trust. Uh, you, leadership, man, you know, if you can have the, the best technical leadership, but if you don't have trust uh, in government, in, in leadership figures, that thing, that thing doesn't add. Third is agency of citizens and particularly young people. Peter makes this point and I think that that's absolutely right. Fourth is the diversification of the productive capacity, uh, which came out in so many ways. And the fifth is, Building institutional capacity, it's a point that Martin ended with, but I want to re-underscore. Because building institutional capacity is not simply the rhetoric of it. I come from a sector where university vice chancellors have been talking for 30 years about how they're building equitable partnerships. And frankly, what we've really done is weakened institutional capacity in many parts of the developing world under the pretext of solidarity and equity. I think we really need to become kind of pragmatic about what we're really doing and being seriously honest. Because if we don't take institutional capacity, transnational, transcontinental institutional capacity seriously, we will not survive as a human species in the next 200 years. That's the challenge of our time. That is what I think this lecture has been really fantastic about it's something we're going to continue be, be bringing as so as in the conversations that need to happen. And I really want to thank Peter, Saginet, and Martin for a really wonderful conversation. Thank you to all of the colleagues who've been here and participated in this. This has been a really interesting, uh, a really interesting conversation. And I thank you all. May I ask you all to please keep safe, social distancing, wear your masks and care for your fellow human being. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very enjoyable. Thank, Thank you. Bye.